Hey guys, good evening and welcome back to Sports Event Management and Marketing, uh, lecture number two. I uh, hope everybody has uh, gotten used to our um, platform and how we're doing everything right now. Hopefully you guys have gotten into the book, you're reading through the chapters, there's a lot of information there guys to chew on. So again, hopefully you are staying up on all of that. Um, so all that your first discussions are done and your second ones are due tomorrow, everything will be graded by this week. So for the holidays, I apologize, I was off a little bit, so I'll have everything, all of the discussions graded by the end of this week. Make sure you guys stay up on top of that. You've got a case study due uh, as well later on this week, so make sure you get that information. Um, other fun things, other than that, I think we're just moving along. Uh, good questions that were emailed to me, thank you guys. You guys know, always feel free to reach out to me, email, cell phone. What have you. So um, I will also be sending you guys another uh, email which you can reach reach me at. I'm currently in the process of changing positions. Um, some of you guys may know we talked about earlier. I work for the Crown Plaza downtown uh, doing our corporate and sports uh, sales. That will be changing now. I'm actually being moved up to our corporate office and will be a uh, regional director of sales. So I'll be working out of our Crown Plaza airport. I'll be getting a new email address. So the one you guys have, my IEPUI address, always works. I always check that. Um, but I also give you guys my general hotel's address as soon as I have that. So here we go. Into plays two, three, and four. Now we're going to kind of get into the, the nuts and bolts of the actual sports event management and how we take a theory and an idea in our in our um, oh, our objections, not our objections, sorry, um, our, our, what we're trying to accomplish, you know, our, our theme, if you will, and get it off the ground and making it something that, you know, is solid and real. So um, as we look at play two, and again, guys, I'm going to try to skim the chapter for you. Read these chapters. They're very, very important. Uh, they're, they're just loaded with information. I want to keep these lectures as short as possible so you guys, again, just hitting the highlights for you guys. So identifying cost. First off, most important, go to Appendix 1. Look at that. That lays out cost almost everything you could possibly imagine. Now keep in mind, you're never going to have all of those most likely. Now you might if you're doing the Super Bowl, you might if you're doing the Olympics, um, but again, that's going to give you just a plethora of ideas of things you may come across from an expense standpoint. So look at that, get an idea of kind of what we need to think about, where our mindset needs to be as we put on these events. Um, by the way, you guys have some fantastic events coming up. Obviously you have the Olympics coming up in a month. Um, baseball is going on right now. They'll have their all-star game coming up. A great example to look at and watch. Um, again, get out and see events as well. Little League stuff is going on all over the place. 5Ks, 10Ks, half marathons. You get all kinds of neighborhood tournaments. Go watch those and see how they put on. It's a great place to kind of get a grassroots look at things. And then as you get ratcheted up to something as large as the Olympics. So, um, again, we think of events, we think of what our needs are. Okay, and again, every event's a little bit different. The Super Bowl is going to probably use every single thing you're going to find in Appendix 1, okay? You've got security, promotion, uh, large expenses, lease agreements, um, you know, everything down, uh, again, from, from the lanyards, the people wear, the branding, the marketing. It, it's, it's a massive animal when we talk about an event such as that. But then take it down even smaller, and we talk about cost. Look at the Little League tournament. Okay, and again, we go back to what is our goal? Are we going to make money off this? Are we breaking even? We're just trying to have a, a great experience for the, for the boys and girls who are playing in these things. So, you know, their expenses are quite differently. Lineup cards, line chalk, officials fees, um, it may be trophies. So it's, it's, it's a neat way to look at how, how in, in an event, they're all going to have certain things in it. We're going to have costs. We're going to have revenue. We're going to have to pick out facilities or fields or what have you. But the range of what they'll have will vary on, obviously, the significance and, and the grandeur of the event. So keep that in mind, guys. Um, as we go through the book, we talk about cost. Be aware of cost on revenue. Um, and this is something that I think everybody, you know, we talk about ticket sales. We talk about sponsorships. Um, but sometimes we also have to lay in additional costs for those things, okay? If we're going to sell tickets to, say, a Ticketmaster, there's a fee for that that comes out of our revenue. Are we going to use credit cards? There's usually a fee for that. Is there a handling fee? Are we mailing tickets out in advance? There's a fee for that. Are we going to have them come pick them up uh, at will call prior to the event? We've got to have someone staff the window, right? Got to have envelopes to put the tickets in. So we're, we're going to generate revenue off of sales of tickets, sponsorships. We're going to talk about fulfillment costs, okay? So these things that do generate revenue will also generate costs. 
And when we get into the revenue uh, chapter, which is uh, play three, we're going to talk a little bit about how we have to look at the sponsorship and make sure that it not only it not only is is the revenue that we want to either spend on the event or make off the event, but it also has to cover the cost of the fulfillment of that sponsorship. We promise someone a sign. How much does the sign cost? That's got to be taken into account when we put together the sponsorship. So be aware of those. Commissions. If you're paying someone to sell tickets or sell sponsorships and they get a 10% commission on whatever they sell, that's going to come out. So we got to keep that in mind. Um, we'll talk about you know usage fees and discounts. Again, the book does a fantastic job of laying out how that all gets put together and how that will affect our ticket prices. Um, the other one that the event goes into then is event operations or your overhead, okay? So again, electric, insurance, uh, hardware and software as far as computer services go, all of that kind of goes into your overhead. Um, and that's on, that, that's on a grander level. I mean, if you look at, like, say, college athletics, and we're going to put on a women's volleyball game, okay? You, you look at your hard cost, well, you obviously you have to pay for the gym. And obviously that's, that's a great, great expense that's taken a, usually taken on by the, by the university. But again... You know, if there was a rental fee, if you will, you have to have staff. You've got to have a ticketing system. You got to have ushers to take them to their seats. You got to have balls. You got to have a net. You got to have a bench. You got to have a scoreboard. You got to have someone operating the scoreboard. You got to have somebody who's getting the teams to and from the locker rooms. You need security because you know Penn State volleyball plays in front of fifteen thousand. Okay, you know um, Marion volleyball may play in front of their parents. So again, the cost is going to change. It's going to go back. You know, it's going to go up and down. Um, Again, you might go to the very, very small end. You know, if we're talking about at a community event, uh, you know, girls softball, fast fit softball tournament, what are their fees? Well, staff attire, everybody's got to maybe have the same shirts on so we know who the volunteers are. we got to have paper because we're running off, you know, maybe scores and, and uh, box scores to give to people. You know, we're going to have cups because we're going to supply a water station over here for the kids. we got to have trash cans. We don't want to trash the entire field. It's amazing, guys, what you have to think about when you put on any event, doesn't matter if it's a community 5K, doesn't matter if it's the Boston Marathon, okay? Some of those expenses will be exactly the same, although, again, the number of trash bags you may need for the Boston Marathon is probably going to vary slightly from the 5K that we run in our neighborhood. So, again, guys, these smaller events are great things to look at, and then just imagine as you get larger how those expenses begin to expand and change when you have to take into account. We're going to talk, um, the, the book, this chapter talks about your marketing and promotions, everything from, again, what you're seeing right now on Fox, I believe, if they're already advertising the All-Star game, somebody, obviously Major League Baseball is paying for those ads, or it's a combination between Fox and Major League Baseball because they want to promote what's what's on their, you know, uh, line of shows, if you will. Major League Baseball obviously wants you to come out and watch baseball. That's some sort of partnership deal, but somebody's ch uh, putting up money for that, all right? So there's a cost for marketing and promotions. Then you go down to the small end. You know, again, we're going to have uh, a bowl thon and we want to have as many people as we come. we got to put up flyers. There's a cost to that, okay? Again, um, it's, it's, it's interesting to think about this. You know, we, we, we look at these events that we're bombarded with every day from Super Bowls to All-Star Games to NBA Games to Minor League Baseball to uh, the Colts to college basketball and football. And those, you know, we look at it, these grand, grand schemes that have multiple millions of dollars invested and spent and made off of them. But then again, you take it down three or four notches, and there are other things you have to worry about when it comes to different kind of events. And I want you guys to really think about both because I know if you were like me, where I want to jump into when I graduated from college was right into college athletics. I wanted to go work D1. I want to be doing basketball games. I'm going to be doing football games. I'm going to do this, 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 and this. But that's not going to happen for everybody. And everybody's past a little different. Okay. And it may be that your special events that you're working on, maybe you're working for a company like, um, oh, the people who run the 317s, which is, which is a, uh, uh, one of the races here in town. They have five five Ks. If you work with them, again, it's not 100,000 people watching the game. It's 2,000 people participating in your event. And now you've got a whole different set of issues. Okay? You've got you know your runner bibs, your shirts, your registrations, your course setup, security, water stations, so again, I want you guys to keep in mind that your events that you may work may be for 20 people and could be for 200,000 people. So again, don't, I guess what I'm trying to say is don't uh, overlook what you might think of as a smaller event because there's a lot of information and knowledge you can gain from that. So, so marketing promotions, fulfillment expenses, I kind of touched it on already. When you guys do sponsorships, again, 
if you're promising someone a sign, there's a cost associated with making that sign. So you can't have a $10,000 sponsorship and the sign costs 11000 Now That's a bad example, obviously, but you guys understand what I'm talking about. The sponsorship has to be able to cover the expenses of the sponsorship and make you some money. Okay, That's called fulfillment. And again, I do a nice job of explaining the book. Event presentation is the show around the game. Okay, And again, um, depends upon the game or the event, I should say. Super Bowl, we know we could have Whitney Houston singing the national anthem or you know, Blink-182 or Bare Naked Ladies. That's quite the expense to have them come out and sing the national anthem at your event. But that is an event presentation that you have to worry about. Are there going to be VIPs on the field? Is a coin toss? Do they have a fee to get them there? Um, are we just doing an event where we have players, there, there's appearance, there's appearance fees. Okay, so you got to keep that in mind. So again, I'll take it down to a smaller amount. And let me back up. I'm sorry. So we talk about the event presentation. So think about what goes on for the national anthem, okay? Or, or the halftime show of the Super Bowl. It's a concert. They've got to roll out sound system. They've got to roll out stage. They have obviously an unbelievable choreographed um, show that goes on. Well, there are costs with all of that. The light show, uh, the rigging. I mean, you guys name it. The sound system, everything. Well, that's really not too much different from the, maybe the show that goes on at the Little League Ballpark where someone sings the National Anthem. And the reason I say that is you still have to have a sound system. You have to have the person who can sing. You have to have the speakers working. you got to be able to get everyone's attention and stop what they're doing. Again, it's a much, much, much smaller level. However, it's the same kind of concept. That would be part of your event presentation and something that you would have to keep in mind if you're the one putting on that event. So... Um, the last thing the book talks about, and you know, hit on this um, in uh, I think all three chapters actually, and that is the reforecasting. So know that as your event uh, becomes uh, comes to fruition, if you will, you're going to go through and probably change some things. You know, you might have said, "Man, I think we're going to need ten thousand dollars for you know, um, oh, let's say our announcing crew." Well, we got a bunch of college kids. They're green, but they're pretty good. We've tried them out, and it's only going to cost us $2,500. Okay, just that cost. Here's the one thing we didn't think about, though. We've got to have some place to park the buses that are that are bringing the teams in. We didn't have that in mind. We have to rent this lot. That's going to cost us $3,000, so we got to up that. So all of a sudden, you're kind of moving cost around. You're, you're adjusting different things. That is key not only f during the event, and obviously during your, pre you're sure your planning stages, that's key because you have to know how much revenue – you're going to have to bring in to cover these expenses. But as you go on, if this becomes a yearly event, you then have a very good understanding of here's what it will cost to put this event on, and now we know what our revenue goals are going to be. Again, if that is the goal, either to break even or to make money. Okay. So there's play two or chapter two. We get on to play three, and now we're talking about revenue. So the other side of the ledger, if you will. So... You, we got to identify. We're going we're to identify what our revenue or our revenue streams are, if you will. So, on page forty-eight, it's a uh, figure three one three point one. Again, another great job. This book does a fantastic job, guys, of making it very easy for you guys to break down the concepts you need to understand. Okay, and like I said, use the appendixes in the back of the book. It's phenomenal. Um, so again, the one thing we're going to look at uh, revenues, and again, the book touches on it. I'll throw a few of them out there. Tickets, concessions, parking, programs, sponsorship, all of those things fall under revenue, okay? They're generating um, cash for us from the event, okay? So we're going to touch on a few of these real fast. Ticket sales, most of you guys understand what that is. Obviously, if you've ever gone to an event, a concert, what have you, you pay admission. That's your ticket sales. The book is going to break it down. When you put on an event and you're, and you're trying to figure out what expenses you can cover, how you're going to cover them, what our potential revenue is, obviously the first thing you need to do when you turn the ticket sales is break down your location. You know, it's easy if you're looking at IUPUI's on-site, you know, basketball, or if we look at Carroll Stadium where the Indy 11 play. We know that place holds, say, 11,000 people, okay? If every ticket is average price of $10, we know then that we can make $110,000 off that event if, and this is a big if, if everything was, every ticket was the exact same price. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about how you comp some tickets, you have group discounts, you know, and obviously most venues don't just give a single price. I mean, some, some venues do do general admission, 
So then everything is the same price. But most of your, especially your, your major league teams or your minor league professional teams are going to tier their pricing. Closer to the field, closer to the court, the price goes up. Further away, it's usually less expensive. So again, you're going to have to figure out what is your gross, what's, what's your potential? What is the gross potential of this event? If we sold every seat in the building and here is our tier process, what can we make? Okay, now we know what our ticket revenue is, potential ticket revenue. Now remember, we have to subtract some things out of there. Commission, usage fees for credit cards, is there a handling fee? Are we comping a number of tickets? In a, you know, a perfect example would be, again, that volleyball example. Each team's coming in to the arena, but we actually give each team 75 comp tickets so their families can sit behind the bench. That's revenue lost, okay? We can't count that. We don't get anything for it. It's a complimentary ticket. So you're going to figure all that out, okay? And then that, when you know what your, what, what tickets, I'm sorry, when you know what seats you're going to make your money off of and, you, and how much, then obviously you can begin to figure out where you want to set your pricing as well. So you might just start generic and say, okay, if we did general emission, what would be our, our gross revenue? X amount. All right, let's get a little more creative. <clears throat> let's say we, we priced this here and this here, we discounted these, and you can begin to play with those numbers, and now you can say, okay, I have different revenue goals I want to hit. Here's where my pricing strategy has to be to get to those revenue goals. Now, when we do start setting prices, there's a number of different other issues we have to consider. Okay, do we have an event history? You know, has this event been going on for 30 years and we know what the public's going to pay? Is it a first time event? Those are the scariest. Okay, you try to find a comparison event to say, okay, here's what they charged in a similar market. Maybe we can charge that same thing. Okay, what's the perception of the event? Okay, is it well received in the community? Is it something that they take pride in? It, are we pulling people from outside to come to this event? Is it not even locals that are going to be there? It's going to be people coming in to the event. That may play into it. Um, and again, going back to that event comparison, you know, what else do we know that's out there and what are they charging and how is it received? Are they getting good numbers? Are they selling out and they could actually have raised the prices a little bit more? Are they struggling to fill it? Does it matter that we're a cold weather city and that was a warm weather city? All these things have to be taken into account. And lastly, the local market. Obviously, what can, what is the interest level here? What is the income level here? Again, um, one of the perfect examples I always give, and this is going to date me, but back in, I think it's 2001, it goes back quite a way, um, the World Basketball Championships were held in Indianapolis, and it's probably the only time I've seen the city take on an event that was probably an absolute flop. Um, nobody locally, and, and, and this was shocking because obviously, as you guys know, this is a, a state that takes pride in basketball and, 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 and loves it and considers it its own. But these games were so poorly attended, and I volunteered and worked them, and I could sit there and count the people in the stands. And I think when, 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 when I've looked at that event and said, okay, where was, how did it fail so bad? Well, number one, it's an international flavor, okay? So you've got Greece, you've got Turkey, you've got Lithuania, you've got the U.S., you've got Brazil. So people who are behind these teams are typically people from those countries. Now, Indianapolis is somewhat diverse, but does not have the diversity of a Chicago, a New York, an LA, a Dallas, an Orlando. So we don't have pockets of those um, people who would be from those countries. So you didn't have a built-in fan base that might take pride in their country and come out and watch these games. You had locals who obviously would love to watch Team USA, which is what they came out and did, but didn't have very much interest in any of the other teams. And even though they were giving away tickets, even though they were going after the right groups, you know, you're going after youth basketball, college basketball, you're going after people who you think would be fans of the sport, it just didn't generate any interest or buzz, and it really failed quite miserably. Um, and maybe that was uh, Indianapolis not looking at their local market and saying, you know what, we don't have the ethnic pockets that we probably need to really push this on an overall event. Team USA was going to draw because Team USA was who they were, okay? And I think, if I remember right, Reggie Miller played on that team. So you even had a local star that was playing. So those games drew very, very well. But Turkey-Greece, again, there were 15 people in the building, you know, and five of them are volunteers. So, again, keep that in mind as you're setting your ticket prices and your expectations. Another revenue stream, sponsorship and advertising. We've already talked about sponsorship as far as making sure we take into account those costs. But sponsorship, as you guys know, can be put on anything. Again, there's web sponsorship, there's in-stadium sponsorship, there's radio, TV, 
Um, you get everything from merchandise sponsorship where you're going to partner up with somebody and there are some fantastic ones out there where, um, again, your uh, perfect example, uh, Pepsi uh, is a sponsorship of Butler University. Um, obviously, I, I, I tie to the athletic department. When they had the backs of their trucks, they advertised Butler basketball. Those Pepsi trucks drive all over the place. You see them, you see them all over. The Indians actually have them as well. And again, that's a moving billboard for, for the athletic department. You know, and again, that was part of the Pepsi deal. They didn't really cost Pepsi anything other than to put it back there. They were going to put some on the back of the truck anyways. So now they're going to do that. Butler has this part of their sponsorship package. It's huge. It's huge. And sometimes if, 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 if the event maybe have been sponsored by somebody else as well. So let's say, not an event. Let's say the game is going to be sponsored by Crystal Flash. Crystal Flash carries Pepsi. There's a three-pronged sponsorship there. So now Pepsi on that, say it's a game day spot. You know, they're going to start promoting Villanova wins the national title. They're playing a Hinkle on January 18th. We're going to run the back trucks for Pepsi with Crystal Flash on there because it's the Crystal Flash game. And now we're promoting a venue that sells Pepsi, so they're excited. Crystal Flash is excited because obviously they're in the back of these trucks. We're excited because we're on the back of the trucks and everybody wins. Okay, So you're going to see a lot of those kind of sponsorships. Um, again, take into account where you're at with sponsorships. When, when you... When you sit down and you start planning out this event, you can't automatically assume, hey, I'm going to have $500,000 in sponsorship dollars. There's a lot of things you have to consider before we go into that realm of event planning, okay? And the reason I say that is we're going to talk a little bit here in chapter or play four about rental and about where, where your games are being held, where your events are being held at, what kind of facility. If that facility has exclusivity on certain things, you can't go after sponsors in that category. For instance, if you're going to do an event at um, Banker's Life Fieldhouse, I believe that is now a Coca-Cola facility. That being the case, Pepsi cannot sponsor your event, okay? Because you can't have, Pepsi will not be able to have a presence in that arena, all right? Unless, and sometimes arenas will do this, they'll make sure that there are deals when they put their, when they put their sponsorships in place. So again, when Banker's Life sells their sponsorship, they might say, we're going to pick three events that we're going to black out the sponsorship. Every other event that's held in Banker's Life, your sponsorship will be up there, except for three. And it might be the Big Ten Championship, it might be the Women's Final Four, and it might be a Taylor Swift concert. Okay, But those sponsors know ahead of time there are three events they don't get. They get the other 67, so it's still a pretty good deal, but these three events they don't get. And that's something you're going to have to know about your venues. You know, am I locked into certain things? Are there certain um, are there certain areas of sponsorship I can't go after? You've already got the car taken care of. So okay, so I can't go after automobiles. You've already got soft drinks. I can't go after that category. Um, you've got, you know, Papa John's. Okay, I can't go after Pizza Hut then. So, again, you have to know this as you're putting together your advertising and sponsorship plans. Um, so, again, you know what you can and can't go after. Um, you've got value and kind sponsorships, and these are tremendous. You'll see a lot of these, especially in the athletics world, where we do trade. I'll give you 100 tickets. You're going to give me uh, 50 free pizzas. And I'm going to do promotions for my student section every game that the first, the first four fraternities or first two sororities that get to the game get 25 pizzas. Well, I've used the sponsorship that only cost me tickets. They're the cost. There's a lost revenue there. I get this entity. I turn around and use it to advertise and promote and hopefully draw people in and generate some revenue. So you'll see how that kind of all goes around. So, and it could, it could be something even more established than that. It could be, you know, you're working with, um, oh, what's a good example? You're working with Coca-Cola. You know, for the pouring rights of Hinkle Field House or for the Jungle and IUPUI's campus, they're going to get signage and this and this and this and this, and we're not really going to pay for them to pour a Coke, but we're going to allow them to be the specific provider of soft drinks. And, oh, by the way, um, every Coca-Cola you, you sell, you get... 75% and I get 25%, something thereof, okay? So it ends up being a, a pretty good deal that Coke has a presence at IUPUI. We're making revenue off the concessions. And a lot of times Coke is usually willing to, to broaden that package and say, okay, we're going to give you one or two inserts in 24 packs. We're going to give you, again, back of Coca-Cola trucks for a week to promote your season ticket sales. So there's all kinds of things that those in-kind can help alleviate costs that you typically have to pay hard money for that you're going to trade product for product, if you will. Um, do, 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 do. What else? Advertising. Um, we kind of talked about it. In the arena, can you advertise? Who's got certain uh, product uh, categories You know, you can't go after, you can't go after? 
Website obviously is huge now. You guys know better than anybody. The social media platforms are out there using Facebook, using Twitter, being being hashtagged with um, whether it's again uh, certain entities. Uh, you know, you're hashtag with the Pacers. That's a pretty big deal. You're hashtag with Bank One. You're hashtag with somebody who has you know 10,000 followers. So again, all the social media platforms now, uh, from Facebook to Vine to Twitter to YouTube, you name it, it's all being used by these by these events to help promote and excite people about what they're doing. Now we talked earlier about the emotion part of it. How many of you guys have gone to YouTube and seen, I do it all the time with the 5Ks I run. They'll have videos of the previous 5K. And it could be a fun run like, you know, the, the color vibe they actually did over at the, um, the fairgrounds. Or it could be one of the night ones where they're doing the strobe light and it's, everything's flashing up. It's cool to see those videos because that gets you excited about what you're going to go do makes you maybe a little less hesitant to go ahead and put down the $35 it costs to make that run. So, um, again, you guys know it better than I do what, what social media platforms out there and, and, again, how they can bring everything to life uh, for people from an advertising standpoint. And what's really nice about a lot of those, you know, your quality can change from a professionalism of how it's recorded, but most of that is, is free. And again, this lecture right now I'm doing from the confines of my house and my, my office uh, with a very little itty-bitty HP camera that I'm talking to, and, and again, the quality probably is not CBS broadcast quality, but again, if it gets my information out there and it's another venue I can use, okay. Another, I should say another platform I can use to get the message out, so be it. It didn't cost me a dime. So, um, a, a few other things we're going to talk about in the book. Merchandising, again, keep in mind that if you bring some in and sell merchandise, typically you're sharing part of the profits or you've had, you have paid, you know, you could pay, you could pay volunteers to sell, but you had to pay to create the product, therefore... Make sure you price it high enough to cover your cost. Be aware that some venues will ask for a percentage of things. That's the other thing you look at when you do ticket sales. The venue might say, there's no rental, but we're gonna we want 10% of your gate, 10% of your concessions, and 10% of your merchandise sales. And you gotta figure out in your head, is that worth my time? You know, is is that worth it? You know, is what I'm gonna pay off of this better than maybe paying a flat rental fee? Um, concessions, again. A lot of that's going to be run internally. Uh, the stadium a lot of times will provide that. They'll have somebody, whether it's, um, oh gosh, we've had, uh, Aramark does a number of different venues. Um, so again, you know, uh, will you be paying them? Will you be getting a percentage of the concession stands? How does that work? Uh, on a smaller stand, on a smaller scale, if you're running the concession stands at Little League Baseball, you got to buy the hot dogs. you got to buy the buns. you got to have somebody there to, to cook them and then sell them and collect the money. So, again, keep that in mind. Uh, you may have to provide everything. You know, so better have that Costco membership, right, so you can get everything on a discount. Um, also keep in mind, too, from a revenue standpoint, uh, actually, I skipped them. Let me go back one. Broadcasting rights. When you get to the higher levels, again, Division One athletics, minor league sports, major league sports for certain, you have broadcast right fees. Where, and again, you guys might have seen, I think ESPN just paid, God, what was it, a billion dollars for the Big Ten football rights? And they don't even get all of them, because obviously the Big Ten has their own channel. So it's, it's the Big Ten says, we're picking up this part of the schedule. ESPN, you can pick up everything else, and especially away games, obviously. Big Ten will have all home game uh, access. So, you know, that's something that, again, as you get up into the higher atmosphere, if you will, of event planning, of a sports event planning, you will begin to see those kind of cost. You're not going to usually see it at the high school level, the, the community level. You might. The IHSA may make a deal with, say, a, Fox, a local Fox Sports affiliate. Fox Sports says, you know what? I don't know that we're going to – we wouldn't pay for these rights, but um, we'll we'll do a trade per se. We'll give you part of the – we'll give you an inventory in our commercials. We'll sell the commercials. We know we can make money off of it, and we'll go that route. So there's all kinds of ways to look at it, and again – you probably won't touch into that until you get to the higher, you know, Division One college athletics, um, major, major events, your Boston Marathons, uh, obviously any major, you know, NBA, NFL, those kind of things, you can see that. So um, then obviously um, I was going to jump down into two other things, participation fees. This goes back to, again, we talk about events. It's not always about the attendance. Sometimes it's about the participants, okay? It could be a, a team fee to play in the tournament. It could be, again, look at 5Ks, look at adventure runs, mud athlons, Spartan races. They're making their revenue off their sponsorship and off the people who are participating. Because people who are watching usually come for free. So, again, you got to look at and say, what are my costs? What are my ability to, um, you know, what is my overhead? 
And then what am I going to charge people to actually participate in this? And where can I make my revenue streams? So again, keep that in mind that when we talk about sports events, it's not always your traditional thought process of going to a game, buying a ticket, and that's where the revenue comes from. There's other streams. And then lastly, grants and donations. You're going to probably see that as well. And again, probably more on the community side or maybe athletic or uh, college athletics, high school athletics, where you can actually get grants and funds that way or donations are made to help put on events. So again, chapter two to, or three does a fantastic job of touching on that. And jump into chapter four here. So chapter four, we're going to talk about solic soliciting and selecting host cities and venues. Now, I get to see a little bit of this in my current job because when these large events come in, the city has to kind of put together their RFP. Or I'm sorry, they're putting together their proposal, which is a response to an RFP. RFP is a request for a proposal, and the book's going to touch on that. And that's basically an event. And again, does it have to be as large as a Super Bowl or Final Four or what have you? It can be as small as I've got a, I've got a, a, a you know under ten baseball tournament, and I can put it in one of three cities. I'll lay it out there. You guys all have the facilities. Do you guys want to host it? And just see, you know, what they're willing to offer. Um, Carmel's done a nice job of really developing uh, the northern part of Carmel into a sports complex up there um, where they've got something in the neighborhood of, I think it's 36 to 50 different fields. Everything from baseball, and, and from baseball it goes to like your 8 and under, your 10, your minors, your majors, your high school, softball, the same kind of breakdown. They've got soccer facilities. They've got indoor lacrosse. They've got outdoor lacrosse. Now, the down part about Carmel is, unfortunately, the hotels have not kept up with them. And so what they're starting to figure out right now, and, and this is kind of a, a good thing for you guys to understand, I think they thought if they built it, they will come. And people have come, and tournaments have come up there, and they're doing fine with that. However, they don't have the volume of hotel rooms to handle all this. And so what's happening is, those people are trickling down to the north side of Indianapolis and even as far as downtown. There's a major lacrosse tournament that went on, I think it's, uh, it was last week or this coming week, and they didn't have the hotel rooms. And all of a sudden, a downtown property like myself is getting 75 overnight rooms for six nights, which is a fairly good-sized booking. It's nice. Um, so again, Carmel can be a little upset by that because here they've invested all this money into these fields. Now, they'll make money off participation fees. Teams are paying to come up there. But... And, and, and why, why cities solicit to have these events um, is the economic impact that it has and typically the hotel rooms that get booked. And those are kind of one and the same. So here's Carmel with all these beautiful sports facilities, but they can't get people to stay in Carmel because there aren't enough hotel rooms and spend their money in Carmel. So what's happening is there's people are going to northern Indianapolis, staying in those hotel rooms and spending their money in those areas. So again, that's why, um, and the book, again, the book does a fantastic job of touching on why this happens. Why does Indianapolis want a Final Four? Well, number one, they're gonna book probably 4,000 overnight rooms in the city. They're gonna, they're gonna have a fan base that's gonna be here usually from Thursday to Tuesday. Those people have to have some place to go eat. They wanna buy souvenirs. They wanna experience the city. They're gonna use everything from our street vendors to our restaurants to our hotels to the things that are unique to the city, Children's Museum, Idol Jorg, NCAA Hall of Champions. When you bring an event like that, you can see easily $20 million get dumped into the local economy because these people are going to spend a lot of money. I can't remember if I touched on in our first lecture. Last week, we had USA Volleyball here, along with 15 other major events within the city. 200,000 people coming to Indianapolis over about a seven-day period. Now, think about that. If each one of them spend $100, parking, hotel room, food and beverage, um, you name it, that's a $20 million spend. And the city obviously is better for it. People invest more in their businesses. We hire more people. Everybody's a little more happy. So again, guys, that's why you're going to see cities really go after this. And it is a very complicated process to take on the large events. Um, in Indianapolis, you're going to have the CVB, um, the Convention Visitors Bureau. We also have Sports Corp. We're very fortunate that years ago, the city said, we're going to make our identity off amateur athletics or professional athletics. That's how Sports Corp kind of came into um, creation, if you will. And they do a fantastic, phenomenal, over-the-top job of identifying sporting events that they think would be a great fit for Indianapolis 
and then pulling the resources necessary to put the proposals together to bid on these events. I have seen us bid on everything from Super Bowls, which we've gotten, Women's and Men's Final Four, Big Ten Championships in football and basketball. We actually bid, I believe, on the Army-Navy game, but didn't make much sense for to bring them here. We don't have that, again, we don't have that military presence here in Indianapolis. Probably not a good thing to bring here. Um, we have talked about bidding on our, creating our own bowl game and, and, and having that here in Indianapolis. You will see uh, bids go out, I believe, for the NBA All-Star game. Um, they've had the minor league baseball all-star game here. So again, you know, this city can handle, you know, I'm so sorry, let me back up, the Indianapolis 500, the uh, Brickyard 400. Obviously, the Indianapolis 500 just had uh, a year that uh, it had not seen since its heydays 20, 30 years ago. And the number of parties that were here, the number of celebrities, the number of, again, I go back to that social media, Indianapolis was the place to be during that weekend in May. And it was absolutely phenomenal. Um, and again, the city makes money off of all that. Every entity from, again, parking to food and beverage to the, the people that clean our hotel rooms, they get longer shifts because we're sold out longer. So the trickle-down effect is amazing. Um, again, looking at the book, it's going to walk you through the RFP process. Uh, when you're the event planner, putting out the RFP. Here's what I want you guys to bid on. Details, your needs, your expectations. You will lay everything out in these. And it is crucial, you guys, that you are incredibly specific to what you want. And again, these larger events, you can't even begin to imagine the different things you have to take into consideration. You know, um, boy, like I said, I, it was going to take me another half an hour to explain all this, but um, the book does a great job of really, really laying it out for you guys. But imagine a Final Four and the things that go into that, Okay. You know, they have bracket town, so we need a convention. We need a convention center. We need sponsors. We need volunteers. We need um, ticketing for that event. Okay, we're going to have four teams come in for the Final Four, as well as all their fans and anybody who wants to watch this event. We're going to probably have to have 16 to 20 hotels because we've got, on the, by the same time as the Final Four is going on, the NCAA is having their Division One, Two, and Three Coaches Conference, okay? So there's some more hotel rooms we're going to need. So now, all of a sudden, you've got to have 20 to 25 hotels, you got to have them in various price zones because I've got Division Three coaches who can't afford, you know, they're going to probably double up in rooms. I have Division One coaches like your Laranegas and Shashevskis and, and uh, Calipari's who are going to have their own suites. And so I've got to have a variety here. We have teams coming in. We've got volunteers maybe coming in. You've got officials. You've got the bands, the cheerleaders, the student sections, um, all their fan bases, that are, you know, their staffs that are coming in. And that's just the hotels. Now we got to have a place for everybody to eat at because the teams are going to do team dinners out. We're going to entertain. Oh, we have sponsors too, by the way. So now we're going to have, you know, sponsors are going to have. Uh, let's see, Wilson, Reebok, uh, what the ladder company is escaping me. Uh, Learner, uh, Warner Ladder. Um, ESPN is going to want to be able to entertain because they're broadcasting on radio. CBS is going to want to entertain because they're bringing all their sponsors in. This is a pretty big deal for those guys. They spent a billion dollars on it. All of a sudden, you have all these different things that. As you're putting your event together, you've got to take into consideration, okay? Transportation. Do we have bus services? Do we need to, to worry about getting people from the venue on the north side down to the stadium? Do we need to worry about a coach just having a car because they're going to have media appearances. They're going to have team meetings. they got to talk to the donors. they got to talk to alumni. All of this is something that if you're planning that event, you've got to figure it out. And if you don't think it's imp – I'll tell you what. I wish I could bring it to you and show you. The book on the final four that the NCAA will hand you is unbelievable and just runs down every possible scenario you can think of as far as a need you may have. Um, because again, they've got to look at it from not only the team's needs, which is usually the most important thing, but administrators, donors, band, cheerleaders, the students who are coming, obviously the student athletes themselves. It's phenomenal, guys. It's absolutely incredible. And so that will come to the city. The city will break that down and say, okay, hotel-wise, we need a hotel with this many suites, and you're going to have the band. you got to be able to provide the meals and meeting space, and the team's going to have their walkthrough. And, uh, you know, Iowa's going to have a, um, a kickoff pep rally, and they need a, a room that can hold 400 people. And, oh, yeah, they're going to have a band there, and we got to have food and drink and beverage. All that gets laid out, and we put together a proposal, and we send it back to them, and then they got to go through all these proposals and figure out where they're going to take it. It's an incredible process, and some of these take, you know, multiple years before they can actually book a city. So, again, I, I digress. I apologize about that. 
that goes back to, though, it kind of leads me into uh, the evaluating of the proposal's RFP. There's a number of different things that are be important for you to look at when you get these back. Um, the cost, obviously, associated with it, where it is, the safety, the quality. You're going to go through and you're going to evaluate all these are, are all these proposals, and then that's how you decide where you're going to take your event. Um, again, event facility-wise, um, once you've kind of narrowed down the city, you might say, okay, We've got the RCA, oh my gosh, I'm dating myself. We have Lucas Oil Stadium. We have Banker's Life. We have Hinkle Fieldhouse. We've got um, Carroll Stadium. You know, What are we going to use these facilities for? Are we playing an outdoor game or an indoor game? Are we doing a concert? Are we doing a run? Figure out our facility, zero in. Now, when we look at that, again, we've already talked about, you know, is it going to be a flat rental fee? We're going to go in and say it's going to cost us $5,000 to use this venue. Bam, we know it's a hard cost. Done. Or is it percentages? Do we have to use their labor? Do we have to use their sponsorships? Do we have to use their concession people? Can we bring in our own? Who does the merchandising? All of this will be looked at as you, again, have that RFP process for the venue, okay? And you're gonna look at a number of different things, you know, because what we need as the organizers is one thing to be concerned with. What do the teams participating need? You know, we might say this venue is perfect for us to sell sponsorship with, but the locker rooms are too small. They've only got three, and this is a, a six-team tournament that's going to go on for four days. Okay, that venue won't work. It's got to fit all of our needs. And again, we talked about how we want win, win, win when we put on these events. Same kind of concept. We've got to look at this really in a broad spectrum because there's a lot of different things that are going to go into making this a successful event. Um, Again, we've already talked about two. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to back up just a little bit. Look at figure 4.3 on page 77. That'll help with the RFP process. Um, look at uh, figure 4.2 on page 76. That'll help you kind of lay out how the CVB gets involved. Uh, again, that's Convention and Business, Convention and Business Visitors Bureau. Excuse me, guys. Um, the other one I want to point out is when you're evaluating your facility, figure 4.6 on page 92 does a very good job of kind of things you want to look at. That is probably about it in a nutshell. That, that was probably much longer than it needed to be. It's 42 minutes. I apologize, guys. I'm trying to get these down to be much, much faster, much quicker. Um, hopefully, they're helpful. Just to kind of give you guys some of the highlights and the, and the big hit buttons you guys should be looking at. Best of luck with everything. I'll have those discussions graded before the end of tomorrow is my goal. We've got that um, first case study, and then the first exam is probably about a week away. So, again, questions, concerns, what have you, don't be afraid to call me. Don't be afraid to email me. Thanks, guys. Have a good evening.